Right. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. So, welcome to the final session. No, uh, I will kind of repeat. It's not the final session. It's the final conference session for the day because we are going to have some exciting uh, poster presentations uh, once we finish this last session. So, uh, this session is going to be on immunization. Um, I was uh, also mentioned this is not anything to do with the COVID immunization, which we have talked for so many times. So this is just going to be about uh, routine immunization. So the arrangement uh, for this session is I will do a quick introduction about uh, the DHIS2 EPI toolkit. So that's the immunization package, as most of you are aware. So I will mention briefly, like what are the components which you have, and then we are what we are going to do is to listen to um, uh, two countries. Maldives and Bangladesh around their experience in implementing these packages. And we'll see like how they have implemented their, these packages and uh, what additional changes they have to do and what were the challenges, right? Okay, so um, we have the team Maldives who will be joining uh, remotely and the Bangladesh of course is on site, right? Okay, uh, next slide please. Right, so uh, I guess like we also uh, mentioned about the DHS2 packages when we talk about uh, HIV. So we have the packages for uh, the main disease areas in, the, in health in the DHS2. So the main objective of having these packages to make life easy for the people who are implementing DHS2 in countries. But I must emphasize, these are not plug and play, right? So we have software that we download from internet, double click and it gets installed. So it's not like that, right? It will make your life easy as implementers, but when you're adapting it to your country context, you will have to do some modifications, right? So we will listen and we will hear more from the countries. What are the challenges they have in using these packages? So that's why we mentioned, so how these packages are developed is that uh, the core team will gather requirements and then we will also get field inputs and we do the configuration. There is a testing and then we release these packages countries are using, implementing, and we continuously get updates from the countries and there'll be new versions of the package that will be getting released. Next slide, please. Right, so what you're seeing here is uh, the countries that are using this WHO packages. So when it comes to uh, EPI, we have 45 plus countries uh, who are using DHS2 for EPI program data. And we have 30 plus countries installing the standard WHO EPI package uh, into their national HMIS. So I'll be, uh, now in this presentation, I will briefly talking about uh, the different components that we have in the package. Yes. So what you're looking here is like a uh, couple of different components that are required in, in, in routine use of immunization data in our countries. So we generally have this, uh, uh, we have the uh, immunization registry. And in addition, we have other components such as surveillance like VPD. And then uh, we also have uh, uh, various campaign related data, LMIS, and we also need dashboards, sometimes dashboards, which are getting information from multiple sources. And then we also have components such as AEFI. Next please. So in the DHS2 EPI toolkit, we have all these components, right? So we have aggregate packages, which we, which we usually have the EPI metadata, logistics, BPD, dashboards, and analytics. And we have uh, some applications. Uh, these are like, you know, we have the WHO immunization analysis app, the bottleneck analysis app, scorecard. And then we also have individual data packages, mainly the uh, electronic immunization registry, we call as EIR, and the BPD tracker. And then we also have other related packages, which include AEFI and vital events. And also we have the documentation to support this uh, configuration of these various components. Next, please. All right, so let us look at various components very briefly. First is the aggregate package. Next, please. So, Aggregate package mainly supports monitoring of vaccination activities, their progress within the target population and informs operational strategic adjustment based on evidence. So uh, it captures the estimates for uptake and coverage across target population. And it helps you rapidly detect trends as uh, much as red flags and dropouts. And it also provides the key geographic information 
uh, of the evolution of the vaccination activities. And also, it also promotes uh, standards for data collection and analysis. So these are the kind of broad objectives and goals of having this aggregate package. Next, please. So uh, uh, now, when it comes to the aggregate module, there are various components. So what you are seeing here is a screenshot uh, of the aggregate package. And then we have, uh, inside that we have, uh, we are collecting outreach sessions and vaccination with uh, various disaggregations and um, uh, even include AEFI, serious and non-serious. So these kind of different categories of data uh, we collect in this aggregate package. Next, please. And also um, there's provision for collecting uh, LMIS related data related to stock and uh, the call chain uh, also in this aggregate package. So you see here, like uh, what you're seeing here is a screenshot of some, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the standard uh, stock details that we collect, but all these are customizable. It doesn't mean that what you get in the package is the only thing that you can use. You will have to adapt it to your country context. Next, please. Yeah. And the good thing is we have this new updated dashboards. So these are improved dashboards. Previously, like some of these uh, outputs were mainly available only through the analysis application for immunization. But now uh, with these dashboards, uh, uh, we can really make uh, ministries and, you know, like whoever implemented these programs get the real data for their uh, information requirements out of these packages. Thanks. And also, we are doing this triangulation. So we have some triangulation dashboards, uh, especially these in gaps and the uh, program performance, where the uh, main characteristic is we kind of combine data from multiple sources, such as IDSR, EIR, VPD, EPI, and so many other sources. So this kind of uh, provides some rich analytics uh, in the dashboards because they are coming from multiple data, data sources. So we can always do these comparisons. Next, please. Right, so the most important thing, like even us, us as in like the senior implementers uh, that, that you see around here. So all of us use the documentation. It's, it's because now DHS2 is keep uh, getting bigger and bigger, and it is very difficult for us not to get, uh, I mean, to do something without getting updated. So whenever uh, even we get stuck, what we do is to refer this different documentation. So we have three different types of documentations for use, design, and implement. So use will kind of uh, highlight all the uh, available packages, apps, and tools, and how can they, how we can use them uh, in configuration as well as uh, analyzing data. And design will more, uh, mainly focus on configuration of the DHIS2 when we are in, uh, implementing the packages. And the implementation is uh, mainly for the non-configurable uh, aspect of a campaign. So uh, this include uh, components like performance testing, user management, etc. Next, please. Right. So what I have been discussing so far is mainly related to the aggregate component. Now let us look at what are the features available in the individual data collection module for immunization, which is mainly the EIR, Electronic Immunization Registry. Next, please. So here we, uh, so basically the purpose of having this uh, EIR it's mainly to improve routine data collection and also it uh, supports increasing the data reliability because we'll be getting more granular data at individual level. I mean, we, initially when we are in implementing aggregate, we are mostly uh, looking at the counts, coverage and things like that. But here we can look at what really happens at individual child level. And uh, when you are designing these resources, there are so many um, uh, uh, inputs that are coming mainly from the uh, in, I mean, recognized institute like WHO, uh, Norwegian Institute of Public Health, and many others. Next, please. Right. So this is kind of high-level architecture of the electronic immunization registry. So uh, we have one program called immunization, which kind of uh, we can divide into two components where uh, we call them as program stages. So one of them will focus mainly on the birth details which is a non-repeatable type of program stage. Uh, we call it in DHS2 terminologies. 
So this will mainly focus on capturing all the information related to the birth. And once you collect that, the DHS2 also has these uh, features available to send notifications, for example, to CRVS system if you have it as SMS and email. And in addition, we have another component, which is a repeatable one, where we are actually collecting all information related to particular immunization events. So here um, we can have birth notification, which is optional. And then we can always also ask pre immunization questions before giving the vaccine. And that can be uh, collected in the system. And then of course, uh, uh, routine immunization. So everything that we generally collect about vaccination, we can uh, also include. And the other thing is there is also provision to override some of the configurations. Next slide, please. Right. So the thing is now here, uh, in addition to collecting data, it gives us a lot of functionalities and control over what we do in user interfaces. For example, we can hide and show program rules. I think you all are familiar with skip logics. So this is really important, especially in the immunization, because like we have to decide like based on uh, which vaccine was given and the age, some components are, are meant to be hidden, right? So all this we can do using these program rules and we can uh, also display warnings and contraindications and we can generate SMS notifications which can be sent to beneficiaries uh, such as parents. And also we can have, uh, if we are using tabular data entry, you can of course have a kind of vaccine card like we, where we will have rows and columns. And then of course, we can also have working lists where we can see like list of children who are to be vaccinated, any dropouts, and the, uh, the children we are expected to see for vaccination in this week, things like that. And in addition, of course, we have analytics and indicators, which is of course the most powerful feature in DHS2 in general. Next, please. So what you are seeing here is uh, 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 how program rules are we, uh, working. Uh, yeah, if you can, next. Yeah, so basically like, uh, if, next please. So here, like, uh, for example, now, depending on uh, if the BCG vaccine is, is given, for example, if I take, take, take one example, so uh, we can show it at date of birth and hide once the BCG is given or hide if the child is more than 12 months old, right? So likewise, we have so many rules which already are configured in the standard immunization package that is already available. But now next, uh, after, after I do this uh, presentation, we will uh, listen to countries to see uh, how they, they actually use this package in their country context, right? So we have the package, the default one, but it's quite interesting to see how difficult uh, for them to adapt it and what are the changes they had to make when they're actually using it in the countries. So what we usually do is to get this feedback and probably there will be a next, next in, in our next release, we will address some of these issues. Next, please. So what you're seeing here is this uh, working list concept. Uh, so for, for example, you can see now here, uh, maybe the next one. Yeah. So you can see these different working lists. So probably like if you want to see everyone who all the immunization patients uh, here, uh, that's what we are seeing because that's the one that is highlighted. And we also have options uh, for the scheduled appointment this week, today, and the missed appointments. Next one, please. Right. So the thing is like this uh, EIR is kind of complementing what we are collecting in the aggregate data. So we have the aggregate package, which is kind of having all the core indicators that we are generally monitoring uh, in the immunization campaign in the country. So what we are actually doing with the tracker is to mainly focus on cohorts, right? And then this data, we are kind of pushing into the aggregate uh, indicators. So it's kind of complementing the, the, the aggregate package that we used to have in most of the countries. I think traditionally we have been using aggregate. So here we are more mainly focusing on cohorts in the EIR. And uh, we also have some sp specific dashboards that are coming in the EIR, for example, for overall rollout, age ranges, dropouts, and things like that. Yeah, next please. Right, so these are kind of uh, high-tech fancy new features of DHS2. So uh, here, what you're seeing uh, from 2.37 uh, onwards, 
with this enhanced maps application we can have organization unit profile so meaning like when you click on a health facility you are able to visualize the key information as well as detailed population estimates so in case even if your country doesn't have population estimates we have this uh, integrations and data coming from grid 3 and worldpop which will generate these nice visualizations for you to get an idea about different areas and the estimated population and from 2.38 onwards we also have these features such as structures map and then facility catchment area layer where again like some fancy new features like we have google earth engine integrations and there are these new apps uh, uh, like grid 3 and this crosscut which we can uh, use to kind of generate and draw facility catchment areas inside dhs so with, with of course with the help of these applications right so there are some exciting new features are uh, coming up every day while we are having the basic requirements that all of the countries need right and of course we have android application so one thing we have to keep in mind is the features available in web and android may be different okay so for example uh, you may have some very new features available for data capture and visualization in android application which may not be really there in the capture application in the web interface for example we have so many new features like uh, so when we use uh, the android application we can do the basic things like registration and tracking patients over time and we can do dynamic data collection uh, based on different workflows and we can also have task listing and for example we can also have this barcode and qr code scanning scanning functionalities these are also there in this android capture application as well as maps views and card navigation so you have some uh, fancy analytics as well as view uh, i mean different views which are available in android application which is not quite there in the web and also we uh, have the data validation Right, so now that you have a kind of overview of uh, various features available in DHS2 aggregate and the case space for immunization, um, like if you, at, at any given time, if you want to read more, because this is just a basic introduction, you can uh, read the documentation which is available. Uh, so these are the links will be available and the presentation also we will share with you. So now the most important thing is, so these features are available, now let's hear how the countries are using these packages and what are the challenges they encounter and how they really overcome uh, all these challenges uh, that we face in everyday implementations. So we have two countries presenting today. First is Maldives. So the Ministry of Maldives will be joining with us online. So uh, two persons from uh, the Ministry of Maldives, one from HMIS and one from immunization will be presenting. And followed, that, followed by that, we will have a presentation from uh, Bangladesh. So shall we get the Maldives team connected? Yeah. Yes, uh, Shama, I think we can see your presentation. If you can put it on presentation mode. Great, we can see your presentation, you can start. Uh, please also introduce yourself because we have two presenters joining online. Um, uh, Dr. Pamot, can you hear me? Yes, uh, Nasha, we can hear you fine. Please proceed. You can uh, introduce yourself and then start. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Pamot, for a very comprehensive presentation from your side and uh, also very good afternoon uh, to all the participants. Um, I'm Nasha from National Immunization Program, and with me, Ms. Shama from Health Information Division of Health will be presenting the details of EIR implementation in our country. Um, uh, in this presentation, we'll try to give an overview of the country, reason for having a system like this, and our main team, uh, timeline of key activities, current status of the system, main features of the system, and uh, future plans for EIR. How this will be, uh, how the beneficiary portal will be, just a sneak peek of the beneficiary portal, uh, which is under development. 
And of course, the challenges while working on the EAR development and implementation stages. Uh, Maldives is a small nation uh, um, because I would like to uh, I, I mean, give a details of the uh, how our country is like. Then only I think the participants will understand how this will be beneficial uh, to our, our country. Like this way, um, uh, first uh, is an introduction of the country. I would like to say the Maldives is a small island nation located in the Indian Ocean. Uh, geographically, the islands are highly dispersed. The country consists of a total of uh, 1,192 coral islands. Among these uh, 1,192 islands, um, only 182 islands are inhabited, and most of the remaining uninhabited islands are used as tourist, uh, uh, tourist resorts and for other commercial uses. Uh, our population is around uh, 500,000, which is including expatriates. Uh, one third of our population is living in the capital city, Male. The annual birth cohort is around uh, 7,000. Uh, as I said before in my presentation, due to this uh, dispersed island in nature of our country, there is a challenge in managing vaccination records. This is the main reason why we need a system like this. The, our current practice of recording and reporting of immunization data are manual, mostly using hard copies, Excel files, and Google Sheets. And it is uh, very difficult for us in the central level to follow up uh, in the completeness and the accuracy of reported numbers. Uh, also, it's very difficult to generate analysis reports dashboards uh, for regular monitoring of the system. And there is no proper and easy mechanism to assess previous vaccination records of a child, especially if multiple vaccinations, um, vaccination centers are involved. In Maldives, um, uh, we are like uh, mostly uh, traveling uh, abroad as well as uh, in at all uh, in the inter country also uh, traveling a lot. So most of the parents have uh, multiple vaccination centers involved in their child's vaccination. So uh, and uh, when uh, in event of uh, loss of child health uh, record book, uh, it is a huge challenge to the vaccination centers and parents, guardians to track the child's uh, previous vaccinations from other centers. And, uh, and they are, therefore there is a need an easier, secure and timely mechanism to assess the full immunization record of a child in a system like this. Um, after several discussions with the technical experts and policy level persons, we had come to an agreement to solve the difficulty in managing our reporting and recording system, which is a uh, shift from manual to real-time digitalization, which includes um, uh, uh, these, uh, as I said, the uh, transition from reporting of aggregated numbers to name-based immunization data available real time at all levels, uh, including achieved uh, through implementation of EA, EAR uh, system. This will uh, allow longitudinal tracking of a child's vaccination status, regardless of where the child receives the vaccination in a secure platform. Uh, the dedicated team behind uh, these are uh, mainly uh, two players. Uh, the core team basic, uh, based in Central. Uh, this includes members from Health Protection Agency, National Immunization Program, members from Health Information Management and Research Division, consultants based at WHO Maldives Country Office, uh, members from his Sri Lanka team, and also the one of the main player, which are the data entry users, uh, uh, our champions actually. 
They are based in vaccination centers across the country. Then uh, let's look under the timeline of key activities is of 6 December 2022. Uh, in June 2022, we have started this work uh, and from uh, until March 22, we have initiated the customization of meta package. Uh, modified and contextualized uh, to the country consists and uh, enrollment registration, birth details, pre-immunization questions, and default vaccine uh, schedule replaced with national vaccine schedule and additional fees were included to capture manufacturer and batch and number details. And uh, from March to April uh, 2022, uh, the initial design was introduced to potential users as a form of a hands-on training, user feedback obtained during the training and post-training using Google feedback forms. Uh, um, in the Google feedback form, we have uh, I had one question which uh, was asking, do you think that the tracker, this is mainly for the, our users. Uh, so we have this question, do you think that a tracker like this would be useful for your work? And uh, uh, 21 has responded and 21 users has responded saying yes to this one. Therefore, uh, we have understood that this is actually not only for the central team, but for the ATOL team also, they feel that this uh, EIR is very important in their daily uh, daily work. And uh, based on this uh, feedback forms, uh, further modification was brought, be, uh, brought and uh, it was updated and shared to the end users. Uh, in May to mid June 2022, the piloting initiated in uh, uh, selected facilities. Um, we have uh, personally, uh, the central team has visited some of these islands and we have piloted uh, in the selected areas. And a Viber based user support group, group was created um, where the uh, users having any difficulty means they will. Uh, uh, right in the group and the, uh, one of the central team will attend to these uh, issues. And in late June to July 2022, the tracker design was changed after considering the pilot feedback and uh, the users are reoriented on pilot and the piloting facility staff to a new design. Uh, data migration and initiation, the use of new design by existing piloting facilities. Uh, from this slide onwards, uh, Ms. Shama will be presenting the details. Shama, please, can you continue? Thank you, Nashia. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, we can. All right, thank you. So Nashia had mentioned that since January until July for six months, we made a lot of customizations at different phases. So what I'll do is I'll quickly run through the key customizations we made to the existing meta package. So most of the customization we made were based on our core team input initially, when we tried to play around things that we started to notice. And then we went to the training, the initial training we had where we uh, sort of like introduced the one and then we got feedback. And then we also did the piloting where we uh, fed live data. And when we started putting live information, then we got more input as well. So based on these three uh, set of information we started to get, we made these uh, uh, changes. So the changes happened on and off. We did go through many, like we went with the change, we went back as well. So when we, when I'm explaining, I'll go through a bit in those aspects as well. So let's go through first the changes we made to the enrollment or the registration form that is available. So in the enrollment initially and in the de default meta package, you actually have a uh, date of registration. But in more these contexts, uh, and I think this is applicable to many other countries as well, uh, since uh, vaccines are given at birth and we have hepatitis B, which we have a target to ensure we gave the hepatitis B vaccination within 24 hours. So 
uh, for us, it didn't make sense to have a separate date of registration and a separate date of birth, especially when the initial uh, vaccination record should be fed into the system at the time of birth itself. So we sort of replaced the date of registration with date of birth. And this is the num date that we will use to do all the program uh, rules uh, because it will calculate when the child would be eligible for the next vaccination. And it will also prompt if the child is being you know, scheduled to give a vaccine a bit earlier, then it will somehow prompt the healthcare workers a message to inform that the minimum duration is not met. So this date is really important for us. So we made that change uh, for, for our um, EIR. And then we went through the whole profile, which is part of the registration form again, and we kept on making further modifications as well. So in this side, in the left side, you are seeing the MODIS customized uh, registration form, and in the other side, you are seeing the default form. So the, we started with making changes even to the unique identifier. So going forward in time, we are currently rolling out uh, electronic immunization registry, but uh, we do have a plan to keep expanding the use of THIS2 to incorporate other trackers in the system as well. So we wanted this uh, number to be very unique to the individual so that going forward, we can start enrolling the same person in multiple other uh, programs, but this number would be attached at system level to the person. So we have that as an additional uh, unique way to identify the uh, person that is enrolled in the system in multiple other programs as well. And we modified it to cater to Maldives context. So we have MDV, which is our country code, and then we have a serial number. So it's very different from what you see in the default, where it's like a year-based serial numbering. And the other thing is, um, in the default form, you have the name of the person broken down by first name, middle name, last name. But for us in Maldives, we don't usually uh, differentiate between first name, second names, things like that. And we just usually refer to the person fully, and then we refer to the last bit of the person's name. And when we uh, sort of deliberated on this, we thought that since we have multiple other unique identifiers attached to the person, maybe having three fields where the data entry user have to uh, run through each one of them separately and enter tries to get the full name of the patient or the child, it might be easier if we have one, um, one only one field to capture the full name. So for us, it, it is enough for us. So we made that modification as well. And we also changed the uh, way the language is in the system. For instance, like for gender, we are more uh, comfortable using sex. And also village is not a concept that is specific to Maldives. So we changed it to atoll and islands because it's more relevant. We have atolls and then in each atoll we have islands. So we changed that. And uh, rather than having a field text, we change it to uh, like a, a full option list. So once they select the atoll of residence, then uh, at the island of residence, it will filter out only the islands in that atoll. So it's easier for, again, for the users to uh, capture the information. So those are the things we made in the uh, changes in the system. And one other thing that we included a new field is to differentiate between a foreigner and a national. And why we had to do is because uh, the unique identifier again attached to the patient or the track, uh, uh, the child would be not would be very different if it's a foreigner or a national local person. So for locals in Maldives, each local child or any local resident would have a national ID card number. So this is very specific to locals, but it's not going to be relevant for. Uh, foreigners because they won't have this, they will have their passport number as a unique identifier. So from here, if that person select that uh, the beneficiary is a foreigner, then uh, we will hide the beneficiary national ID and full mouth phone number, that is the birth registration number, and only it will display the passport number. So we made those modifications as well. So going forward, there are other bits in the registration form, we'll quickly run through them as well. So in the default form, when they capture the mother's information, it's sort of like merged with capturing mother slash caregiver's uh, information. But in our context, what happens is we had a huge challenge when we initiated the data capture, you know, especially because we wanted to capture legacy information for the past three years. That was our target. And the issue that we faced was um, 
there is, even though we say that birth registration is initiated at the time of birth in our, our local birth registration system, the CRA system, unfortunately, due to some minor delays, it always takes a few uh, days for the uh, complete form to be filled and submitted. So there is a delay in uh, the child getting the child's own national identity card number. But we cannot delay uh, entering data into the system because the birth will happen at the time and we, we were trying to push for real-time data entry. So we deliberated a lot and we tried to find a solution and the solution we have so far is that why not we try to identify the child initially with the mother's national ID card number and the date of birth. So if these two is used and if we enter it, we will provide a leeway for them to not capture the child's own national ID card for the coming two months. But when the child comes for follow-up vaccination at two months, then from that point onwards, the uh, national ID card would be mandatory. So from that point onwards, they have to identify the child using the child's own unique identifier. But to do that uh, at the first two months, uh, we relied a lot on mother's information. So we need to ensure that the mother's information is mandatory and it should be separated from the uh, caregiver's information. So for that reason, we sort of separated that in our registration form and we made, made the mother's information mandatory. Now the question will come is, what if the mother is unknown? Yes, it happens in Morris as well. There are some children who are looked after by state and uh, some children, their mother is really unknown. So for the, those, uh, we have sort of like uh, found a workaround where we can give them a specific uh, way to code them, but then the caregiver's name and caregiver's information is mandatory for those situations, but that is not going to be uh, fully uh, reflected in the system because we, we should not um, so somehow like compromise the whole system to cater to few percent of people. So that is the thing that we have done so far. All right, so going back, and here is the major change we made to the registration form. So during Dr. Palmer's presentation, he mentioned about having two program stages in the uh, EAR. Number one is uh, optional more, uh, program stage, which is related to birth details. And uh, that is going to be a non-repeatable one. And then you have the repeatable immunization uh, program stage. But for us, when we rolled it out initially with the birth uh, component as a pro uh, optional program stage, we found that for the uh, users, it was a bit difficult because they have to first register and then they go back to the birth tab and then they enter it. So for them, it felt like they're going through too many stages. So we wanted to cut down at least one stage. So the thing that we found was, what if we move this non-repeatable program stage back to re registration so that when they do the registration, they will do that bit as well. And then they will be done with that. So they don't have to go back to the birth uh, area anymore. So with that in mind, we did that modification. We moved the whole birth component into the registration form. And we also aligned the option list available for different categories like mode of delivery, number of number delivered birth attendant uh, to what is uh, captured in our birth uh, certification form, which is linked with our local civil registration and vital statistics system. And the reason why we did that was because we are still uh, working with the that team to make sure that we can integrate with that system. So going forward in time, Hopefully that integration will come and this will again reduce the workload from our data entry users. But for the time being, we wanted to minimize what is captured and we wanted to align it so that the future when the integration happens, there won't be much of a hassle. All right, so that's it I for the right. registration. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, just a yeah. kind reminder uh, due to the limitation of time we have for the okay. session, we may have to finish in like five minutes. Right. Thank you. So I'll quickly go through the rest of the things. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. Okay, so I will try to rush through the remaining parts. So uh, this slide is very important again, because we made a huge change uh, to the program stage, the way the data is captured for the immunization component as well. So in the actual default package, you have only two tabs here. You will have the, if you have the optional birth information captured there, you will have the birth at birth details, and then you will have the immunization one, which you keep on repeating by using the plus sign. You can 
base a lot of events. But in Maldives, for us, again, our users found it a bit difficult to use that because they are more familiar with the tabular listing that is available in the child health record book. And the tabular listing is usually based on at birth, two months, four months, six months, it will specify which vaccines needs to be given. So we made the huge overhaul of how the vaccine component would be captured as a pro individual, like very separate multiple program stages. So we aligned our vaccination schedule to at birth, two months, four months, and on. So that's how we did this one. And another important thing we did was for HEPB, we needed to identify that uh, vaccinations are happening within 24 hours. So we captured that as an additional field as well. And one more thing we did, which is different from the default form, is that we have the BCG, uh, sorry, the manufacturer and batch number being captured for all routine vaccines, not for the non-routines, only for routine vaccines. And the reason that we did that was because we wanted to embed the AFI or we wanted to have AFI module also within uh, our EAR. So it would be easier once a report comes, they can go back, review the rec previous records and identify the batch number. They don't have to go back and try to look for other information to identify this. The system will already have that information as well. All right, so we also made changes to the pre-immunization questions. Um, the first important thing we did was initially in the default form, pre-immunization starts from at birth as well. But for us, uh, we couldn't figure out why it's so important to do that, especially if no vaccine was given previously, there was no need for us to do screening. So we moved it uh, to capture it from two months onwards. And we also uh, deliberated like there are things will, that will not change that often, like uh, the child's allergy status, the child's immunodeficiency status. So unless and otherwise, if they want to make a change, they can click to make a change and then they can do it. The only pre-immunization question we continuously will ask is about their, the child, whether the child has a fever, because it's important because we have to defer if the child is having fever, fever for some vaccinations. All right, so this is the timeline. I'm not going to go through this one, but the important thing is in August, we started national uh, train. We did an at all and regional training and we went with national rollout. And in October, we officially launched once our target of having all the greater Mali region, bigger birth facilities and all the at all and regional faci facilities on board and live. And this is the current status that we have. So we currently have within the uh, last three months, we were able to scale up and capture 9,700 plus children. And our target for 2022 birth cohort, 54.5% is already in the system. And from 2020 to 2022, for the past three years, already one third of the population is in the system. And for the vaccination centers, we have 191 facilities. And from that, two thirds of the facilities are already on board. And we do have a plan to scale up and ensure by end of this month to reach out to the other remaining one third of the facilities. So this is very classic. You will also know most of the features in the initial design most of the time. I won't go through this one, but uh, what I would like to emphasize is the ad additional features that we, we are thinking of having, and we, we already have some of them, like the traveler's vaccination. So when we initially started, we wanted to focus only on child comp component, but when we uh, realized that there's potential to even capture traveler's vaccination, we decided to in incorporate that and we also roll it out. And uh, AEFI, initially, uh, it's usually not a program directly embedded in EAR, it's a separate one, but we are trying to pilot test whether it works with if we incorporate it in EAR. So we will hopefully pilot it in January. And we also have a VPD module which is coming on, which will be separate from EAR, but we are trying to pilot it in January as well. And another important thing that we have is the beneficiary portal. So until now, the, everything that we are doing is very much linked with data entry users and us, but there is no, nothing uh, useful for the uh, parents or others. So this beneficiary portal will provide a view access, a user interface for the parents to access and check the uh, child's vaccination status. So within one minute, I'm going to quickly go through the sneak, uh, sneak peek of the beneficiary portal. So this is how in the login page appears. So you can easily like log in and then you can actually enroll your child 
And the beauty of the beneficiary portal is you can see a very similar tabular format of your child's vaccination record, as you can see in the child health record that is being carried in Maldives. And it can also have a print, digital vaccination print view as well, where you can use a QR code and another personnel can actually uh, scan the QR code and verify whether the record is actually uh, from a verifiable source and not uh, modified. All right, so I won't touch too much on the challenges given the time constraints, but I will conclude from here. Thank you, Dr. Palmer, and apologies for uh, going a bit over yep. the time limit. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shama, Nashia, and uh, all this uh, team from the Ministry of Health for the presentation. Any, any questions we have from the audience, uh, both online and on site uh, for the Maldives team? Uh, in the meantime, I think, uh, Do we have any, any questions on that? No, no, no questions on that. Right. So it looks like uh, there are no questions at the moment. So uh, thank you so much once again. Uh, so now that we have heard uh, from the Maldives about the challenges and their approach in implementing EIR, BPD, AEFI, and all the integrations and the beneficial portal, uh, let's hear from uh, the, the Ministry of Health Bangladesh how they uh, approach their immunization program and how they implemented it, what are the challenges and what is the current status. So for that, uh, I invite um, my colleague, a team leader from his Bangladesh team, Hanad Khan. Thank you, Pamod. Uh, so here I am again. Uh, immunization program in Bangladesh is one of the successful program of our Ministry of Health. Immunization is started as a uh, quite long ago, and uh, we starting the data entry in 2014. So let's come into the screen, then it's the Google. easy for me to describe. So immunization actually, uh, uh, expanded program of immunization started with the initiation of WHO. So with the help of WHO, we started immunization program in 2011, I think, and 2014, uh, 12, 13, and in 2000. Okay. Next. So in 2014, uh, the immunization aggregate data collection format already developed by us. So the immunization program, aggregate data collection and a similar uh, aggregated logistics already start by 2014. Please. So Pamok discussed about the WHO standard package, but WHO standard package is released in very much later. We started in 2014. So most of the thing we already done by this time. So there's, the component we already implemented is BPD surveillance, the routine immunization, which is the aggregated part, AFA tracker, aggregated dashboard, and aggregated DLMS. So after that, as we most of them are we implemented, so we started implementing the remaining part, the micro planning, immunization campaign, and real time monitoring, immunization registry. So I am actually focusing on the recent MR campaign, which is a huge success for Bangladesh and is a larger scale implementation, and we try to use the DHS2 as a full component. Next. So MR campaign or measles rubella campaign will run last in 2014. Uh, and between 2016 to 19, 85 to 95% of children received first dose and 80 to 85% received second dose of MR vaccine during 2016 to 19. Surveillance data indicate that the measles incidence uh, increased from 1.6 per million to in 2015 to 29 per million in 2019. So government decided to go for a MR campaign, the mask vaccination campaign for the whole country children. So uh, left confirmed cases similar and uh, due to COVID pandemic situation of Bangladesh, uh, we actually rescheduled in 2019-20 early, but due to COVID pandemic, we have to shift it to the 
this 12 December 2020 to 3rd February 2021. Next. So, why we choose, or government choose the DHS2 as a platform, specifically for all components? First thing, in 2013, we implemented whole country with API systems. So, our all user from top to bottom are used to with the DHS2. Well-trained personnel at all level, if the community or vaccinator level, MTPI, that means medical technologist TPI, all is trained on DHS2 because every year the government of Bangladesh have two setups of training on the DHS2 refresher. And so all health people from the managers to worker are trained on DHS2. So that is the one major strength of DHS2. Organization unit required for MR campaign already exists the DHS2. So there are no need of creating new organization unit. But during this campaign, we have to make several temporary organization unit, which we manage differently. Plan to use the same form, same platform, routine API macro plan, so that they don't have to use the multiple systems to have a hassle for them. So with this campaign, we use the two things, the monitoring. So that's what we call, government call is real-time monitoring. That's actually, we use the DHS event capture, we'll show you later, which is component for what we use. So, this the real time monitoring is a this tracker component event capture component actually give us an online macro plan daily vaccination reporting including vaccine and lost queues uh, session supervision through the android app and household visit the first line supervisor through the android app rapid convenience monitoring and rcm by second line supervisor through the same similar and same android app but one dhs app next please Hold on. So for this MR campaigning, we have several key achievements to show you. We can, the managers and the ministry can monitor the daily coverage against the target and all level and providing feedback. So if you see the coverage is low, the expected rate, they can communicate to the field to look at the issue why there is not enough children coming to the vaccination site. Identify area of missed children and mop up session. Those are missed to bring them somehow. So find a way out how could they bring them to the facility? Why they don't care? Session quality issue and monitor and addressed. Identify missed children from routine immunization. So therefore, this we use the real time monitoring. So what is the outcome? We vaccinated within this, this week, like 35 million, 35 million, 585, 691 children within this seven days. So that is the, actually we show how the DHS2 use for this to make a max vaccination campaign. And for the first time we use for real-time monitoring the DHS2, most of the countries uh, uh, in Africa region, they use the ODK to collect the primary data and send it to DHS2. We use the native DHS2 Android app. And with that, we use the event capture to do the same thing. Next, please. So how did, the real-time monitoring done. So aggregate data set, we have the micro planning, daily vaccination logistic distribution, daily vaccination reporting, event capture, session supervision, household visit, rapid confidence monitoring. So all three for three level of user with same Android DHS to have. And all those things is summarized in a daily online reporting, daily online reporting, not, it's a real-time reporting through a public dashboard. Because in DHS2, if you run the analytics, there's actually sometimes the data entry process is stuck. Sometimes we find deadlock. So what we did through the API, we pulled the data from the PHP framework. And here we show the real-time dashboard in every 15 minutes that is refreshed. So that is actually, we uh, made up the challenge. In previous campaign, 
earlier all campaigns the all monitoring is done through the paper and pen so that's why we have the gap we have the reported gap we realize the gap later on so that cannot be addressed so this time managers worker everyone use the same phs system next so in summary if we see the measles rubella campaign 2020-21 which is for 7 days online microplane data set this is i tell you this vaccination site and data the major components are uh, the target children vaccinated supervisor volunteer portal name and their mobile numbers so that's we took from the online microplane as a part of that and we pull and put it in the dashboard the vaccination logistics management which is session wise vaccination and logistics planning and vaccination reporting daily coverage vaccine and logistics use express and this is the data entry forms so supervision and monitoring team this rtm is previously done mostly by odk they collect the data through the odk uh, our few african countries also do the same thing and send data to the dhs too for our case we are using the android app and use the event capture event capture data entry in the android app. so that's how we try to monitor those supervision and monitoring issues so through this monitoring issues we observe qualitative and quantitative aspect by supervision apps session observation household visit apps coverage and miss children in the rapid convenience app of rcm this quality coverage miss children and community awareness this is the three component these apps work both online and offline that's why we use the dhs to android uh because we have many places there is a hard to reach areas and some places you don't have internet even some places we even has a photograph of vaccination on the river on the boat because there is no way you can go there so do there some area we have to go to the boat for vaccination as well all national and sub national manager use their android apps for the campaigning supervision and monitoring so most cases our field worker already have the tabs or personal smartphone so there's two devices are using for this all those campaigns daily analysis of supervision and monitoring data help the local and national level managers because this data is every evening is monitored by the managers so decide the next steps so if the coverage is low under the expected coverage then they will ask so who are missing why is not coming to the facility so what they did actually they do by union and ward there is a vaccination center they compare with the micro planning which children are missing which area which household so they go to the household and try to bring the children which is called mop up mop up to the center next day so that's how that is achieved previously all checks are in forms so that is actually takes a long time and actually just not give a result at all we know the what is missing earlier but for dhs2 we know the dead day those are missing so next day the people go to their home bring that to the facility or they go to the home because usually what they do in the villages if there is children missing they bring all children in one home and the vaccine go there and vaccinate them so this methods we follow then this mr campaign next so this is one uh, example of the public dashboard because for that we make the several public dashboard components this is one of that so from that up is the summary where they can say that you see the coverage is 104% means those who are expected more than that we achieve so uh because uh, the, we the targeted with the estimated value how much children we, sh we should vaccinate but at, at the end we vaccinated 104% so this is one example of the bringing but this is uh, we are not in that case we are not using the who dashboard component this is actually our national requirement so we build as a web portal so that the managers can see directly from here but that is a filter option divisional coverage supervision 
so they can filter down which want they want to see so manager can see his own district or upazila and find out so what is the missing or what is the problem how that can be that be addressed next please so lesson learned from our implementation each of technology in our case in dhs2 to stand the national e health and management information system is the best way out so if you want to do something we first try with the dhs2 if we can do then we will do full of this so if cannot then we look for the other system because we know that our workforce is habituated they can implement very quickly so anything we can introduce just make an online training and everyone can ready to enter do the same thing for mr campaign there is a specific need because the first time they are using the tab or mobile at the remote vaccination so that is there is a challenge but that was quite well done government ownership to support the sector as and the partners is the key so in that case uh, the all partners unicef who especially unicef as a key role and the, we will say that the success uh, for the success the major credit goes to the who uh, unicef because the unicef used their field staff all field consultant to supervise and communicate with the managers on the regular basis second thing is the who second partner and the government of course that's time the all epi managers they are not find anyone in the office all mostly in the field uh, and uh, yeah, third thing which is designing user friendly apps so we try to make a convenient way to interface in bangla so that the people can understand the ui was in bangla so that user can quite easily understand what we are asking for and they can do and minimum keystroke they should we we try to capture so that's how the we make the app is user friendly also we are using uh, dhs2 and not providing any additional devices dhs2 android app can be used for the large scale this is the we proved that with the dhs2 android app you can you can make a large scale implementation and this is the proof because 35 million more than 35 million no one in the world is trying to use the dhs2 android app before dedicated technical team is required because that time we have severe performance issue and unicef team we and oslo team as also is involved in here especially bob is very much involved with the whole process dedicated technical rigor to continuous troubleshoot technology based real time system support in intense monitoring and achieving despite pandemic even during covid pandemic we can achieve the target properly which is government actually want to delay more because they say that during the during Uh, according to due to pandemic people might, might not able to reach the facility or you cannot achieve beyond 85% here we have actually achieved 104% which is a tremendous success for the bangladesh so this is from my presentation i think thank you thank you everyone if there is any question Yes. So thank you very much, Hanan. Uh, so it's time for questions. Uh, so we invite both on site and online. Yes. Uh, very good morning. Uh, I don't know if it's a good morning or good afternoon day. Uh, first, I want to congratulate for the presentation. Secondly, I have some questions related with experience that uh, they had related with the campaign. I would like to know what was the big challenge that. Uh, you guys face during the the campaign related with the with the data data synchronizations and uh the the really update of the dhs2 uh, regarding with the the mobile devices if you guys didn't face any problems related with uh, when you guys are on the field uh, capturing the data okay uh, thank you i got uh, if i got clearly that you are asking the data synchronization issue of the dhs standard app right yes the synchronization of data uh cause like what i understood like you guys have a uh, uh, online and offline mode uh, on the right. mobile device right. and uh, while we are capturing capturing the, the data 
uh, sometimes you just have some problems. Um, I have this experience from Mozambique. Actually, I'm using DHS2 as well. And uh, we are using both systems uh, offline and online. But uh, sometimes we have this challenge of uh, synchronization of data. And uh, actually, uh, we are having facing some problem related with the uh, <clears throat> uh with a uh, android uh and uh i don't know if uh, the new version of dhs2 if thank you it... the, uh, thank you for your question so in the H and android synchronization the first key thing is you have to be very careful about designing as is synchronizing offline means when you are working you are entering how much better and how you design if you design too many texts, too many uh, huge load of data, that will definitely took time to synchronize. So try to minimize your load. So that's why we do. We are collecting very small amount of data as much as low as possible. One. Second thing, we are not capturing any emails or any huge heavy data. Number two. And third of all, we are trying to use the newer version of the DHS2 and the Android app because the newer version has a lot of optimization at the back end and also at the Android part as well. And so in the front end. So if you are using the older version, like before 36, you might have the, you might have the problem with the performance, but if you are using the new version of Android the newer version of the DHS2, you should not have the issue, issue with the synchronization. If you have, then you should review your data set or uh, your tracker or capture and you should try to design as concise as minimum load. And also you have to care about the cohort. So it is the user base, means those user is logged in, only his part of data is synchronizing. So if I am logged in as an administrator, the whole country is under me, this is really impossible because we cannot synchronize 35 million data one together in a tab or mobile phone. So you should be careful about design the cohort, how much data for that specific user. So for one uh, EPI vaccinator, he hardly have a thousand. So it is quite low load for a tab or PC and it's quite easily synchronized. So it's both way. As color client end, you have to be careful. Also at the server end, you have to make your network and accessibility of the server is quite wide so that there will be no bottleneck at the server end as well. Thank you. All right, thank you. So we have a few questions from online participants, but before that, we will take one from the audience here. Thank you very much. Really interesting uh, presentation. My, I have actually two questions, but I don't want to take the others on waiting online. Um, what is the baseline data you calculated or you used to measure the missing children that were not vaccinated? You, miss, you mentioned that there are missing number of children. Uh, you calculate what is the baseline data and what is the effect of DHIS um, on the uh, vaccination coverage? Is it like increased, decreased, stayed the same? Um, and this is like a practical the implementation of the system. What is the impact of the real implementation of uh, the vaccination coverage? Thank you. So only one microphone. Uh, thank you. For the, your first question, uh, actually, uh, the first baseline is the our micro plan. So micro plan is supposed to collect the data from the field. What is the age target? Initially, what we do, we will do the population based uh, uh, projection, and accordingly, we do the micro plan. But this micro plan is higher level because we have projection up to the sub district level. But for this, we do at the ward and zone level. After sub-district, we have the union. Union has word, word has zone. So up to this level, we make the micro plan. Those micro plan is also very huge. So it has the 85,000 around number of facilities or place where you do the micro plan. So in the one union, the health worker already know how many children is there because he's for his community. So he knows there's 100 children in the village or not. So that's why we do the first, the micro plan then get the data and accordingly plan the all thing, vaccination logistics event. So if there is a hundred children, we need the hundred buyers. So we have sent a hundred buyers to the specific facility with 10% addition or like this calculation they have. So they send that. So though there is some hostess because of open file hostess and closed file hostess, you know. So that is the baseline. Uh, for a second, 
portion, this actually the qualitative, uh, we still say there is an issue. Why? The microplan sometimes is not 100% accurate. They sometimes make assumption, not always is a perfect because they do say, okay, I visited, I find there's uh, 45 children. Actually, there's 55 children maybe. So that's how it happened. We find them. So now the next challenge for us is the finding zero dose in Bangladesh. So where is finding zero dose and how that can we find this is quite difficult because we already implement DHS to another system to find out the gap, but we don't find still there is some children is missing. So we have to find out because when we do the national level aggregation, we find that we have the 85 to 90 percent coverage. That means we still have the 10 percent gap. So we have to feel that. So we have to find that how the next challenge is to find the, the 10 percent. So next challenge for Bangladesh is the finding zero, zero dose. Thank you. So we have two questions online and then I will come back to you, Saurabh. So the two questions, I will combine them together because they are again related to uh, missing children. So probably the only uh, uh, area that you may have to answer is whether you are using uh, GIS in tracking the missing children at the moment. GIS, whether you are using GIS or DHS to track the missing children. Uh, well, we actually try those, but the thing is how we do the micro plan, that's the quite important. So what we find, uh, for example, uh, there's a survey by PATH, though it's based on secondary data. So that's we are having planning to make the detailed survey on a specific sampling area to find out why and how this happened. Because after we using GIS micro plan, we find still, still, still we find 5% gain. So this MR campaign, you see the 104% means it's against the target. But when you make the survey, you might find it's not the 104%, it's maybe 90%, 95%. So there will be survey and they will find out how much actually left behind. So that is the challenge. So uh, what the JS mapping we have, if the data is correct, JS map can reflect direct from that properly that there is correct. But if data is based on the assumption, is a, is a data is based on assumption, not counting the each children, then it will not the real time thing. And actually that's happened because when the health worker is going there, he might not skipping several households. So that's, we don't know. So this is not a problem with the system. That's with the, who, the using the system. Thank you. So I think we can take one last question. Uh, Saurabh, you, you have a question? Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for presenting your work. Uh, I have a small query regarding the public dashboards uh, because there's, it's a lot of, it's a common requirement in each region these days. So uh, did you face any challenges while implementing uh, those dashboards as, uh, as you said that you refresh each 15 minutes to uh, present the, to show the live data. So how you manage that uh, while doing the authentication or sessions, how you were managing those kind of things, or did you face any kind of challenges? Thank you. Uh, the trick is we what we did actually we did the several script. So there is a scripting. We make a separate data cube. So we pull the data from the DHS two to the separate data cube, and that's what we do each fifteen minute stream. So this is only read request. So there is no lock in the DHS two side. Because this actually what we try to pull the one session on one day data always. So there's a comparatively low less of data. Because uh, and second thing is we use the cron job, so it's automatic. So if there is a failure, that will show us why the fail. Usually there is no fail because we, this is only read request. But we make an intermediate data cube where the data will be stored. And the challenge is that because the data cube means whole data set is here. So that's the problem. So we have to make the wastes of resource, the server resources for this, but we, this is the something better than nothing. If you do the directly from the DHS2, sometimes DHS2 system is quite become slow or hang, or if the analytics is running, that time is not possible because if they're updating the data or deleting data and pushing the data, there's no request. So for safety reason, we do that reverse way we make a separate data queue from that is pulling and the gis is show, or the data visualization showing from there because sometimes the problem with your decision maker if you cannot show them you may lose his job 
So that's the director level of challenge. So if they go to prime minister office, they said, make sure the system is running. So uh, yesterday I got a message, the prime minister visiting Cox's Bazaar, make sure the Cox's Bazaar vaccination system is okay. The COVID vaccination system. So I said, okay, we say it's okay. Now up to you people to <laughs> give it okay. So. Yes, we up to then the dashboard each 15 minutes. So we pull the data each 15 minutes and update it. Because that's what the real time monitoring means is real time. So they have to, but we cannot make it the exact real time then. So first we try, uh, try the continuous analytics and then we find that there's, uh, there is several deadlocks. So we skip the idea. So we go and then that, this. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Hanan and uh, the entire team from uh, Bangladesh for their nice work. So thank you so much. So again, uh, thank you very much for both the ministries who presented today. So what we discussed in this session today was to give you a brief idea about uh, what is available in the immunization package in the HIS2, uh, which covers both aggregate and individual based uh, data collection. And then we heard from two countries in the Asia region, uh, how they are using the HIS2 for collecting their vaccination uh, information and uh, the challenges they are encountering in using uh, the packages and how they overcome these challenges. So that's what we have discussed in this uh, session. But I know there are so many of you joining here on site as well as online who has uh, stories to share about your uh, implementations in uh, immunization. And one thing we have noted when we are observing the community of practice. So a question, are you all familiar with uh, what community of practice is? I hope, yes. Yes. So if you, if, if by any chance, if uh, any of you are not familiar with community of practice, please Google, right? The, the first link that will be coming up in the search results is going to be our official um, link for the DHS2 community of practice. So if you have any success stories or even the challenges, if you fail implementing DHS2 for immunization, we would still like to hear that. So please post your stories in the community of practice. Uh, we would love to um, hear those stories. And probably uh, you may also get a chance to uh, maybe present in all these conferences that we are having throughout the year. So once again, thank you so much, uh, everyone. And I think we can move to the one final session that we are having. Don't worry, it's not going to be any presentations, but uh, Surajit. So actually it's not, it's not an actual session. Yeah? So we just have a, a question and answer lounge for anyone who wants to stay. Now I know it's been a long day um, for all of us. So if you would prefer to take a break, don't worry, we have the dinner tonight. I'll ask uh, Hung to explain in a moment all about that, but we can come sit around with you during dinner. Just have a, a light discussion on you know any questions you might have. And of course we can answer in more detail um, when we're together in the morning tomorrow as well. You're a bit more refreshed. So, you know, I know it's been a long day. We're happy to stay around of course, if you have any questions for us. Um, but if you pre would prefer to kind of take a little break, please feel free to do so. And we'll make sure to kind of um, come check on you guys during the dinner and see how you're doing. And if you have any questions, then um, we're more than happy to answer them at that time. Of course, we have a number of other sessions that we're going through in the next couple of days. And if you see your topic might be addressed there, you might want to wait until that session. But we're also happy to answer any other, other questions you have uh, about any implementation concerns or if it's a more technical consideration as well. Um, so, okay, I'm just stepped out, but we'll, we'll just wait for her real quickly so she can explain the dinner. So also um, for the posters, um, they're also here. So if you would like to chat with any of the team members about the posters, um, they will stick around for a little while and you can uh, feel free to ask any questions about that as well. Once again, no obligation, this is optional, um, but we will be here and uh, are happy to answer your questions. So I'll just go grab Hung um, real quick. Hung, um, can you explain the dinner? Back. She, she was 
Good afternoon, everybody. I do hope that the, um, you like, you enjoy the day. So as I mentioned this morning, uh, this evening we will have a gala dinner. Uh, the plan is that we will have a barbecue party on the beach outside the restaurant where we have a lunch today. Uh, but uh, the restaurant does call me to inform me that it's sound, that it's wind rain soon. Uh, so in that case, you look outside, there's no rain at all, but uh, they are the local people. They can read the weather. I don't know. <laughs> they call me that it's wind rain in five minutes. So I do hope that by the time we have a gala dinner, uh, the rain will stop so we can enjoy the beach outside. But uh, unfortunately, if the rain doesn't support us, we have to move inside uh, the restaurant where we had lunch, okay? So um, I think we will have a group uh, photo here. I think so. Yeah. I, I think now it's better that we have a group photo here in front of the backdrop. Uh, in case tomorrow the weather is very nice, the sunset is amazing. So Grant can help us to have another photo on the beach. Okay, thank you. All right, everyone, let's come up real quick and let's uh, let's take a photo and we'll take another one outside if we can tomorrow. And for those of you online, um, thank you very much for attending. And we'll continue the session tomorrow at 9 a.m. Vietnam time. Um, and and uh, we'll open the same Zoom link and all the details for the sessions are available. If you're having trouble accessing any of the material, um, please let me know or any of the other team members know and we'll make sure to sort that out for you. The session is also recorded. Um, so if you missed any of the sessions earlier in the morning due to time differences or, you know, whatever the case may be, we will make sure to share the recording with you as well, and you will be able to view that at your leisure um, when you have more time. Thank you very much for attending, and we'll see you guys online tomorrow at the same time.